Amen. Please be seated. I want to welcome you today to the Church on the Corner. All right, very good. Just want to like pray a little bit and just invite you into the service to just give your heart, to throw yourself at his feet and watch him bless. God, we just want to thank you so much for the opportunity to be with you today. We want to thank you, God, that you've given us mercy, provision, and protection. We just lean into your promises today, and we worship you, give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. And I am going to do the welcome, 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 welcome. We used to say when we were younger in church, um, I welcome you once, I welcome you twice, I welcome you three times in the name of Jesus Christ. <laughs> That's a shame I remember that. In, your, in your, um, the back of your seats, you'll find your welcome card. And online, on streaming land, you will find this online, your welcome card. On the back is the QR code. And that will give you so much information that's going on with the church in the coming times. And we're going to go to our slides. And what's going on? Let's see. We have our holiday planning is coming up. How many are excited about the holiday? Right? Christmas is coming. We got so many things that are happening. And gathering, we're going to gather um, at 1130 in the Commons next Sunday for our Christmas caroling ministry to the our shut-ins. We're going to plan for our Christmas service, which involves decorating the church, mailing 5,000 invites, designing and executing a very intricate service. How many were here last year for the service? All right, we're gonna do that again. It's all hands on deck for the event. And it's our huge opportunity to connect with our community and with Christ. And guess what? There's pizza. <laughs> All right, and so now is the time that we can sign up for uh, the Halloween on Solano. Um, we wanna, first of all, thank many of us who actually uh, bagged up 1,000 bags last Sunday. Now, we were supposed to do that last Sunday and this Sunday, but that old saying, many hands make light work, there were many, many hands in that room on last Sunday. So we got them all bagged. Um, now, uh, we need your help. On Tuesday, October 31st in the afternoon from 3 to 5, set up, um, help with bean toss, goody, the goody table, shoot the gong game, and of course, the cleanup. <laughs> Use your newsletter link or connection card to sign up, or even just show up. If you can't get online or whatever, Believe me, we are not going to turn you away, especially for the cleanup. It's our huge opportunity to connect with our community. Uh, don't miss out. This Friday, October 20th, is Emotive. Church on the Corner is a part of the growing uh, healthy church. Annual gathering is this Friday at 630 in San, San Ramon. Time of renewal re-envisioning and recommitting to our collective mission. Great time to connect and learn from our tribe. Use your connection card to express your interest for carpooling. Also, see Laura, Laura, raise your hand, Kate, Janet, um, and they're also thinking about going. And now we are going to watch the emotive video to get you more inspired. Hey folks, this is the month, October 2023. It's one of the biggest months in the history of growing healthy churches. It's big 
because we're giving the biggest invitation for all our pastors and staff teams and church board members and key volunteers to come together and join us in a service of renewal. Friday, October the 20th at 6.30 p.m. up at Church of the Valley in San Ramon, California. A service unlike any service I can remember GHC ever having done in my knowledge of GHC. A service that's focused on spiritual renewal that understands both the fire and the form. I've been learning that GHC must prioritize itself not as a denominational region or as a growing healthy churches network, but the genesis of what we need to be about is biblical renewal. We want our churches, our pastors, our network to know his fire to come, his empowering presence to do what human strength cannot do. In a day when pastors and congregations are struggling, when it's hard to see the gospel being outworked, we need his fire to take spiritual ground for the kingdom of God at a time where we've lost so much ground. But we also need his form, holy patterns to remake us. We want what Tim Keller termed ecclesial revivalism. We want the energy of revivalism to permeate our forms, our programs and structures. We're birthing new initiatives and new ways of being a network that are all about spiritual relationships, gospel-centered friendships and Christ-modeled servanthood. It's a new day and it's a new way at GHC. And on October the 20th, we'll set the tone and the compass bearing for the next few years. We want to be a GHC that is influential for the kingdom rather than influenced by the world, as Mark Sayer put it. Everyone is invited. Come on, you don't need to register. You can give one night to come and be a part or just prayerfully sit and listen. It's Friday, October the 20th, 6.30 p.m. in San Ramon. Remember Friday traffic. Give yourself time. And don't come alone. Two, three, a car load for the price of one. And what's that price? Zero. Zero dollars. No cost, no registration. But you might end up seeing the new and signing yourself and your church up to be a part of it. And the price of that is seeing the gospel come in greater ways as we work together. Hope to see you all. October the 20th, San Ramon. Good morning, everyone. I'll be reading the scripture reading, Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 through 10, the Beatitudes, which I love. One day... As he saw the crowds gathering, Jesus went up on the mountainside and sat down. His disciples gathered around him, and he began to teach them. God blesses those who are poor and realize their need for him, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. God blesses those who mourn, for they will be comforted. God blesses those who are humble, for they will inherit the whole earth. God blesses those who hunger and thirst for justice, for they will be satisfied. God blesses those who are merciful, for they will be shown mercy. God blesses those whose hearts are pure, for they will see God. God blesses those who work for peace, for they will be called the children of God. God blesses those who are persecuted for doing right, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. Amen. 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 Thank you, Janet. It's good to see Derek. I haven't had a chance to see him much, um, so we're kind of like passing like ships in the night here. But... It's just really good to have you back and that I get a chance to worship with you. 
I love the fact that I get a chance to worship with my family today. We want to really just invite the Lord in right now, and let's give him, just throw your arms open to give him everything that you have at this point. This is a call to worship. Father, we just bow our heads right now in thanks and in reverence so that you can come in and have your way. So God, we know that you inhabit the praises of your people, but we know that you're seeking such to worship you. So God, we do both today. We give you praise and honor, but then we open our hearts and worship. Stand with us, please, and worship. Thank you, Jesus, for everything that you've given us. So let's worship. Give him everything that you have. If you're following the news, that there's a war on once again, um, full-scale war in Israel and in the Middle East. And um, we're not here today to say who's right or wrong, but that war is just hell on earth. And it's hard to watch. And we mourn uh, for people who are victims. The, um, <clears throat> the nation of Israel has been oppressed since the covenant of Abraham, all the way back, all the way back, thousands of years ago, over and over again, and once again, we see it in the news. Um, so today, with a heavy heart, um, I <clears throat> bring some worship songs for you today. They're not all going to be in a minor key. Um, they're going to be thoughtful, though, and I just want you to take them in, think about the lyrics, and, um, and be prayerful. Be prayerful um, about this war. We pray for the peace of Jerusalem. God calls us to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. So... Those who trust in the Lord are a strong mountain they will now not be moved. Those who trust in the Lord strong mountain they will not not be moved those who trust in the
presence in the midst of world chaos and all the disturbing news that we hear. 
We know that you are a God, that you are an awesome God, that you are a mighty God. You are a God that endures through the ages no matter what we're going through, no matter what the world is going through. Lord, give us your peace. Give us your love. Shine your light in our lives. Help us always to remember how good you are, Lord. You are a great God. You are a good Father.
Well, I'm, I'm not used to this treatment here. Somebody walking me up on the staff platform. That's powerful. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. It is indeed a joy and an honor and a pleasure to be back with Church on the Corner one more day. I've had a lot happen since I saw you last. I had a chance to go back to New York City, see my loved ones, and um, celebrate the 40-year anniversary of my uh, decision to receive Jesus Christ as my Savior. So, yeah. So I'm glad to be with you. Give an honor to Pastor, first of all, to God, and then to your pastor, Pastor Tom, in his absence. Um, I'm going to say a uh, before the prayer, and then we're going to get right into God's word. Amen? Amen? Eternal God, thank you so much for who you are, God, and who you are to us. God, you have done so much for us. God, thank you for the blessings that we have to, to live in a free country, God, to live in a country where uh, away from a totalitarian regime, a country where we can vote, oh God, and we have uh, so many uh, great resources that other people in other lands couldn't even imagine. God, today, as we go into your word, speak to us, oh God. Talk to us and show us your way. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Today I'm going to be sharing from uh, the, the book of Luke, Chapter 21, 1 through 4, and the sermon title is going to be called Giving Back to a Giving God. Verse 1 reads, as Jesus looked up, he saw the rich putting their gifts into the temple treasury. He also saw a poor widow put in two very small copper coins. Truly, I tell you, he said. This poor widow has put in more than all the others. All these people gave their gifts out of their wealth. But she, out of her poverty, put in all that she had. It is said that Jesus spoke more about money than he spoke about heaven or hell. I was told that as a child, when God's got your money, God's got you. Some of Jesus' most riveting, most powerful teachings and stories were about the love of money and about the road to which that leads. You remember the story of Lazarus and the rich man. You remember the stories of in Matthew chapter 25 where Jesus talks about judgment day and how we will be judged according to what we did for those who had so little. Now, this story takes place in the temple treasury, which would have been located in what was known as the Court of Women. You see, the great temple of Jerusalem was not completely accessible to all people. There was sexism in those times, as it certainly is today. But they made sure to place the offering baskets in the place where women could get to them. Women always run the church. <laughs> women always support the ministry. Nowhere was the great wealth divide in the ancient world more visible than it was when the worshipers came together for the annual temple tax at the great temple. Now, back then, you couldn't send in your tithes and offerings via Vedmo or Cash App. You couldn't put an offering, you couldn't put a check in the offering basket. There were 13 receptacles in the great temple, and what you gave was open to public view. When you dropped your money in the offering basket, everyone would see what you're dropping in the offering basket. The rich people would walk into the temple draped in plush clothes, uh, all eyes on them, and they would make a great show of showing how much money they had to place in that offering basket. You'd see them leave a king's ransom, and they wanted you to see that they were leaving it. The whole offering thing can be uncomfortable in church, can't it? First, giving is the most unpopular subject that you can actually bring up in church. If you are an evangelist, you won't want to come to your preachathon with a sermon. You got a choice. You're an evangelist, you got a choice. Two sermon titles, right? One is How to Receive God's Miracle Blessings. And the second one, Why God Wants You to Give More Money to Your Local Church. 
Now, which of those two titles is going to draw the most people? There are even some churches that practice what I call holy extortion. When I first became a believer, I visited a small Pentecostal church in the Bronx, New York. And I'll never forget the offering that was taken that night. One of the members got up, I believe he was an usher, and he walked to the front and he called out a number. Let's say he said, tonight, church family, I want us to raise $500 for the house of God. The organist began to play loudly. Now, this is the cue. Everybody in the church knows the routine. They know the drill. Everybody stands up, and then they march in single file past the table that's here that would have the offering basket on it. And uh, they would tell you, even if you don't have any money, you've got to march anyway. <laughs> Their theme was to embarrass you. Anybody ever seen that happen before? Their theme was, you are going to give, and if you don't give, we're going to embarrass you. So when the parade is through, the man reaches into the basket, he counts out the money, <clears throat> 5, 10, 15, uh-oh, and there's, he says, oh, family, we're still $100 short. What a terrible thing, but we can solve it. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to take another offering. So people get up, and they march around again, and we walk up, and he says, if you don't have any money, tap the basket anyway. That means next time you know you're going to show up with some money. So we sit down and he counts the money. He, no, at that time he promised, he said, this is the last time. He goes, this, now even if we don't get all the money, this is the absolute last time. We, he sits down and he still comes short of the dollar amount. You know what he does? He broke his word. He goes, we're going to take a third offering. Now, in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, what's really going on? Why are we really here? Are we here to worship or are we, you know, put, but, um, buy new rims on the pastor's caddy? I marched toward that offering basket that night, and like many people, I sat down and I wondered, what is this really about? I was ready to go home. That's why your brother-in-law doesn't come to church. He says, all these churches want is your money. Anybody ever heard that said before? All these people want is your money. I heard a minister tell the story of how, how his family would go to church every Sunday, and it was one of those traditional families, mom, dad, two or three kids. They'd sit down. The mother was really the religious one in the family, and she would drag the father by the collar every Sunday out to church. He had to be dragged through the front door. For dad, it was a ritual. When the preacher began to start talking, the, the man would reach into his pocket and he would pull out a $1 bill. And he would twist that $1 bill and he'd fold it until it was the tiniest ball he could possibly put it, make it into. And then when it was time for the offering to be passed, he would throw that rolled up tiny dollar bill into the plate. It was so difficult to pull that dollar bill out to make it usable that often they would just throw it out. That was his dad's silent protest against the church offering. Folk don't mind singing. Folks don't even mind preaching. I was preaching one Sunday in a church, I won't tell you, in a nearby city. And I thought I was doing pretty good that Sunday. I got about 10 minutes into this. The pastor told me that day, he goes, I'm inviting you to come to my church, but make sure the sermon is not over, over for like 15 minutes long. I got to about the 10-minute mark, and I thought, gee, I'm doing pretty good. This guy rolls, put, picks up his arm like this, and there's a, a big watch on him. <laughs> anyway, um, people don't mind preaching, but the offering, I've been in, I was in a church last Sunday when the pastor was, when the service, the beautiful music, great preaching, when they gave the call for the offering, a bunch of people all over the auditorium walked out. Giving is a very controversial subject in church. And yet in verse 1 of chapter 21, Jesus made it a point to notice what folks were giving to the ministry. I imagine he was probably sitting near that box. <laughs> verse 2 says, he also saw a poor widow put in two small copper coins. 
Poverty in, in, in ancient Palestine was different than poverty in 21st century America. It was difficult for a woman to get work at all in society, and it was such a sexist society that if a man left his, uh, had a large sum of money, often he couldn't, wasn't even allowed to leave it to his wife. So there were women who were forced into prostitution because they could not, they could not go out and get legitimate work. In that world, you couldn't work at McDonald's. There was no public assistance, no, no welfare, no social security, no disability. If you were a woman who died, with, you, you were left without means. I mean, if your husband died, you were left without means. If anybody had a great excuse for not putting anything in the offering basket, truly, it was that widow woman. That money might have represented her day's room rent. It might have represented her day's meal. The scripture takes great pain to tell us how small her gift was. It was her offering was just two small copper coins. The Message Bible puts this translation like this. Just then he looked up and saw the rich people dropping offerings in the collection plate. Then he saw a poor widow put in two pennies, it says. He said the plain truth is that this widow has given by far the largest offering today. All these all these others made offerings that they'll never miss. She gave extravagantly, the scripture says, what she couldn't afford. She gave all. Think about it for a second. You are living in poverty. You're this woman. You're living in poverty. And your poverty is so deep that in Jesus' eyes, it's the most noticeable thing about your condition. He's probably looking at you from across the room, and he realizes that you're poor. If Jesus could see that she was poor from a distance, that means that she was probably ragged. Her shoes were turned over. She might have even been barefoot. And then Jesus describes her offering. Notice Jesus doesn't say, oh, it doesn't take all that. Or, baby, put that money back in your pocket. I know you need that. Jesus acknowledges her sacrifice. Friends, how deep is your sacrifice? When was the last time you gave until it hurt? Giving is the greatest challenge of the Christian faith because of our relationship to money in this society. One of the instruments that I use to, can you bring me that, um, that piece of paper there on the seat, please? Thank you. One of, the instruments that I, one of the instruments that I use to prepare a sermon is this book. I just bought the cover. It's the IVP Bible Background Commentary. And it was written by one of my seminary professors. He was a brilliant man. He is, not was, he is a brilliant man. His name was Dr. Craig S. Keener, K-E-E-N-E-R. I'd urge you to go to YouTube. He's got some channels there where he breaks down scriptures. Dr. Keenan was my favorite seminary professor, and he was probably the most brilliant man I've ever met. He was certainly the greatest theologian that I'd ever met. You could open the Bible to any book of the Bible, any chapter, and he could tell you what book you were reading from and what chapter it was. And he truly, truly loved God. Dr. Keener lived like the woman in our story. He was a seminary professor who actually lived in the dormitory with the students. He had no car. He owned one powder blue suit. Now, what makes me think of Dr. Keener this morning, other than the fact that he, was, he wrote the commentary that I used to prepare this sermon? If you could see the top of this, it says, over half a million copies sold. Follow me now. Let's say that the book sold, this book sells for $30 or $40. Let's say that his royalty cut off of that is probably 25%. He's written a slew of books, but this book alone would have made him a millionaire. Consider the fact that he's written all of these books, and the question is, where does the money go? Dr. Keener donated that money. He supported Christian ministry in Africa. He sent huge sums of money overseas for the sake of the gospel. I had another professor in the same seminary that uh, he often talked about Christians and the relationship to money. In fact, he wrote a classic book that I urge you to get. It's called Rich Christians in an Age 
of hunger. His name was Dr. Ron Sider. He passed away not long ago. Can I tell you something that really blows my mind? It's a question that I, I just can't fathom. You see, I serve people who are very poor. I, I've, my, in my day-to-day -day life, I go out to the, the encampments in Oakland where people are living something, in something that looks like a garbage dump, where people don't have access to food, they don't have access to showers, they don't have access to water, where people are living in great misery. And I often wonder to myself, why the church folk are not more concerned with the fact that people are not only hungry across seas, but across the street. And last week, I put out a call for a woman. I put out on Facebook a call. I was, there was a woman, she's living in, a, in the back of a car. She's disabled. She cannot walk. She lives in the back of a car on a side street where there's a lot of violence, drugs, crime, uh, and she's homeless. Imagine living in the back of an abandoned car. And on Facebook, I practically begged. I said, this woman came to me, and she needs blankets. She needs a blanket. Who can donate a blanket? And I listed a no number of things that people could donate. I, one day I looked up and there was a knock at the door at, at, at Homies Empowerment. And it was Sister Alice, one of your members. And she had bought a bag of things, hygiene products and things that this woman could use. But we never got the blankets. And I thought to myself, we as Christians have been given so much. There's somebody somewhere that's got an extra blanket in their closet. Well, what's going on inside of us that we could know that this woman is sleeping in the cold and the wind whistling through that car at night, but there's not enough in us to say, let me give her a blanket. I, when I go out into the encampments, I met a woman there, and she had three children living in a squalor living in deprivation, living in, in a place where they don't have, like I said, clean drinking water. Her kids are often dirty. And when I went to Christian people and I said, we've got to do something for these people, I met, was met with a lot of resistance, a lot of anger. They said, why? They, some of the pastors got very angry with me because they felt like uh, that's not everybody's ministry. That's, that's your ministry. That, that we, we don't all have to be concerned with the fact that people are hungry. But when you read the scriptures, Jesus talks about giving because a lot of the money that's supposed to be given to the, to the temple was supposed to go feed the poor, the hungry. We're looking at the news today, and there's struggle in the Middle East. We all saw what was happening. We all saw the invasion uh, of, of Gaza. We all saw the, the bombs, the missiles that were raining down on Israel. In the middle of that conflict, there were children. There were elderly people. There were people who need medicine and clothes, who, food, who cannot get it. The, we're not talking politics here. We're talking humanity. Children on both sides. Some of us are saying, what should I do? What can I do? I'd urge you to go look up Amnesty International. There's places, I'd urge you to look up um, humanrightswatch.com. There are organizations where you could give a dollar, two dollars, three dollars. If you look on the internet, um, UNICEF, there are so many organizations that a little bit of money could make a difference. And I think uh, last week somebody came to me and they said, uh, I'm, I'm without housing. I don't know what I'm going to do. And I called the Bay Area Rescue Mission here in Richmond. And I said, I've got somebody who's in trouble. Can you help? And they said, send them here. Right down the street. Doing an incredible work. How much of our resources are going to these people who are doing the work? Finally, how, many, how much of our resources are coming into this house? You know, in, in church, there's, you know, I talked about a church where there was a squeeze to give people money. And I've seen that. I could literally, I literally, I wrote that in a book about some of the things I've seen as far as the, as far as how 
um, churches will embarrass people and shame people and push people into giving. That's not a part of this ministry. But yet, to keep the lights on, to keep that PG eating on, it takes money. When we look at, you know, when my mother passed away, my mother was a strong believer. She was somebody who lived the same way in church. that She, she lived the same way at home as she lived in church. She was the same person all the way across. But you know what was one of the greatest signs of her faith? When she died, I looked in her checkbook, and her checkbook matched her testimony. She gave and gave to the ministries that she believed in. I'm going to encourage you today, friends, when you leave this place, to think, sit down in a quiet place and think about what my wallet and what my checkbook say about my faith. The story is told of a wealthy man who was on his deathbed. He called his wife to his side and he said, baby, I have one final request he said, I want you to bury me with all my money. He said, now promise me. And the wife looked him in the eye and said, all right, honey, I promise. He was a very rich man. Not long after the really wealthy man died, they had a huge funeral, and then there was a, a, they had the burial. And at the burial site, the woman's sister walks up to her, and she whispers in her ear, and she said, Betty, did you really Bury Fred with all that money? And she winked at her and said, yes, I wrote him a check. <laughs> the truth is that none of us is taking anything with us. I never saw a Brinks truck follow a hearse. Somebody called me while, not long ago, a few weeks ago, and they said, Rev, what is life all about? Why am I here? Why am I existing? And I'm going to tell you something that the Bible shares with us. God said that we're to love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love our neighbor as ourself. You and I are put here. How many people want their life to have meaning? How many people have ever said, my, my, what am I here for? You are here to serve others, to be the hands and feet of God. God wants to infuse your life with meaning. God wants to give you purpose. And you're going to find that purpose by serving, by doing, by giving. You have been created to share. And friends, I want to encourage you to let this sermon walk with you as you travel into the world. Give back to a giving God. Thank you. Let me say a word of prayer uh, for, for us, if that's okay, before I step down and let the music aggregation. How many people are just been blessed by the music ministry today? <laughs> These powerful songs. Let me say a quick word of prayer, and then we'll uh, give the, sermon, give the uh, time back to the music ministry. Eternal God, we worship you, and we praise you. God, we pray, worship you for who you are. You've given us so much. God, I was in Africa once, and I saw people who didn't even have shoes. They make the poorest people among us look wealthy. God, you've given us not only material things, but you've given us the greatest gift ever, your only son. Touch our hearts, God. Because in a time when there was hunger here in Alameda County, in a time when bombs are falling in the Middle East and there are ways that we can be a blessing, God, teach us how to give. Expand our hearts. Go into the quiet places, the closets that we have kept locked. And let us trust not in our wealth, but let us trust in you so that we can give away wealth that can help others. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank you, Pastor. Reminds me of a verse. There's a verse that says this, give, and it'll be given unto you, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, right? 
will men give into your bosom, they not only give back, but they give to your heart. It's a heartfelt thing. It's not transactional. It's just what happens. So we really appreciate that reminder that we should give. Cast your bread on the water and it'll return not many days since. God is not the kind of person that will do things because you did things. But he is that way. It's just something that it's a reflection of what happens and it comes back to you. Thank you, Pastor Hurt. And did you know, we, we come from those kind of churches that you were talking We've about. We've seen it happen firsthand. We've seen it happen firsthand. <laughs> but did you know that, that giving touches the community? Your giving is what happened last week as a result of what happened last week when we did the thousand bags. It was because of your giving. We could not have done that without you and without you in streaming land. We could not have done that. And it touches so many, many things that we do here at Church on the Corner. And it, you know, it, it's, it's all about sharing God to, sharing Christ, sharing God to the community, to the people, right? So that they will know and see his Shekinah glory shine through. As we have here, this is what your giving has done. And I said it earlier. Many hands make light work. This is what happened on last week. Everyone jumped in. I am so, so, so happy. You know, Pastor had asked, uh, and Ms. Dorothy had asked me to lead this, and I was elated to do this. This was exciting. And to see all of you jump in as you did. And I also have to mention Ms. Sherry, who's not here because she sent me a photo of 90 bags that she did at home as well to join in this project. So thank you so much, Ms. Sherry, and thank you to all that who has participated in this. And there's more things to come. We have Christmas and a whole bunch of other things that are coming, which is the reason why your giving is so important. It's not just about, as Pastor Harry reflected and said, how they did in the churches by asking for money and asking for money and asking for money. But what are you asking for it for? We need to reach out to the community and share the love. Just continue to share the love. So as you take, a, take the next few minutes to fill out your connection card and do your giving, in the back of your chairs is an envelope and online, you can give online as well. And we're going to take the time um, to just reflect on Pastor Harry's message and how important you are in the giving ministry.
As Pastor Harry said so eloquently, God is faithful. Amen. He's been faithful to us. He hears our prayers. He's true to his promises. And so we're going to sing a song just about that. I'm going to leave you with this song. Please stand if you're able. Thank you so much for the freedom that you give us to worship you in this country. Thank you for all your promises. Thank you for your faithfulness. Um, Lord, penetrate our hearts and help us to be cheerful givers every day of our lives, not just with our finances, but with our actions, uh, with our time, um, with all that we have, Lord, um, we pray. Um, help us to live that out. We pray all these things, and thank you for this service, Jesus. We pray in your name. Amen. 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 All right, great. Now, 
I'd like for you to do something a little different, a little special here. Let me first give you a blessing, and then I want you to do something, okay? Right? The Lord bless you and keep you. Matter of fact, matter, why don't you say this to each other? Turn to your neighbor and do this. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Now turn to somebody else and say, I love you. And there's nothing you can do about it. Hey, amen. Thank you. 